Okay, so good morning. So today we have the pleasure to have David Kaiser. So David works at MIT, uh, where he's a professor of physics in the, at the physics department. But he's also uh, James Hausen, I hope I pronounced correctly, <laughs> professor yes. uh, of the history of science in uh, MIT program on science, uh, technology, and society. Mm -hmm. uh, so in physics, uh, David works uh, on various topics, quantum mechanics and also cosmology. He's an expert uh, on cosmic inflation, especially the end of cosmic inflation, reheating and preheating, as he told us yesterday. But uh, recently he was also involved in another version of the Bell experiment mm -hmm. uh, where the the measurement apparatus are triggered by the light of some distant astronomical uh, sources. Um, on the history of science side, he has written many well-known books and award-winning books. One on Feynman, where he explains how Feynman introduced uh, the, the famous Feynman diagram. He has also written uh, what I consider as a fantastic book <laughs> about quantum mechanics, how the hippies save physics, which tells how some uh, maverick physicists living in the 70s in California uh, pushed, uh, well, academic physicists to develop a theorem uh, in quantum mechanics that are now uh, at the basis of uh, what we know as quantum information theory. And today he's going to speak about Einstein, so thank you very much, David, and the stage is yours. Great, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Merci beaucoup. It's a, it's a great, great pleasure to visit. And I want to thank uh, both Jerome and also uh, Vincent for arranging my visit. It's been um, a terrific visit so far. I look forward to the workshop uh, later in the week. So I want to thank you both um, for, for inviting me and, and bringing me here. So today I want to talk about um, an historical project that uh, I've been working on for, for a couple years. Uh, on some aspects of the history of general relativity. And I want to start with, this, with a portrait of Albert Einstein, a familiar portrait, I'm sure, for, for many of us here. I think when many of us think about Albert Einstein, we probably think first of a picture like this, of, of an Einstein later in his career, um, sort of away from, from, um, from the noise of, of everyday life. He's now sequestered at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. It seems very much as if all he needs is a stack of paper and some sharpened pencils, and that's all he would ever need. He famously told a journalist early in his career that his ideal occupation would have been a lighthouse keeper. He really wanted to be a away from it all. Uh, and, and a question that I keep coming back to is how accurate is this sort of self-depiction that Einstein so carefully cultivated over the years? Does that help us understand Einstein the person? I think it, it is at best a rather partial view. In fact, Einstein was uh, deeply involved with politics from his earliest uh, life as a young scholar right to the end. He was a thoroughly political person. In fact, he was an outspoken opponent of uh, what he considered German militarism. He was a socialist and a pacifist at times when this was uh, not making him very popular within Germany. Uh, he was actually kept under surveillance by the American FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, even before he uh, emigrated to the United States because he was perceived to be such an active political radical that he was a danger to the country, some feared. So we have a lot of, of, um, of scholarship now that has looked at Einstein as a political person, as someone deeply and explicitly involved with worldly politics, as I say, from, uh, from his early career really right through the end. And in fact, the FBI was so worried they compiled a 2,000-page secret dossier on his activities. So he was considered deeply political uh, th throughout his career. So that's a question I like to keep in mind as I come now to what is arguably his greatest scientific legacy, something that we all here uh, uh, know deeply and, and care about very much, his, his grand theory of relativity, general relativity in particular. I like this, this, uh, this portrait, this cartoon quite a lot. This comes from George Gamow. Gamow, of course, helped to invent our modern picture of the Big Bang. He was also an award-winning uh, popular science writer, and Gamow used to enjoy making his own illustrations for his popular books. So this is from Gamow's own hand. This depicts what Gamow called the Temple of Relativity. It looks, of course, quite a bit like the Taj Mahal. Uh, 
We see the field equations in this magnificent marble dome, the, the uh, geodesic equation carved into the stone here. And the idea, as Gamow made very, very explicit in the accompanying text, was that relativity was indeed this sort of beautiful structure apart from the world, separated from, from the mess, the tumult of everyday life. In fact, Gamow said, separated even from the rest of physics, for better or worse. And so my question is, does this depiction of general relativity serve us any better than that picture of Einstein, the person, so removed from the political world. Uh, we get this reinforced not just from Gamow, but from, for example, the great mathematical physicist John Singh, who wrote in his textbook on general relativity in 1960, of all physicists, the general relativist has the least social commitment, Singh wrote. Uh, he might have said the least social skills. He actually said the least social commitment. Uh, let the relativist rejoice in the ivory tower where he has peace to seek understanding of Einstein's theory as long as the busy world is satisfied to do its job without him. Again, this notion that, that relativity, much like the person of Einstein, is somehow separated from the tumult, from the activity and the drama of everyday life. So is this any more helpful for us when we try to understand how we've come to learn about Einstein's theory and the warping of space and time. And I want to suggest to you with a series of, of moments from the history of this great theory that this depiction of, of Einstein himself and of his great theory as being separate from the rest of the world, I think that obscures as much as it enlightens. So I want to talk about a few moments over the past century of people uh, earnestly trying to learn about relativity uh, where they've been inescapably en enmeshed in the world, and that has actually had a, a bearing on how we've come to learn about relativity itself. <clears throat> so we know an enormous amount now about how Einstein arrived at the general theory of relativity. Uh, he worked for the better part of a decade, as many of you may know, uh, between 1905, when he put together wh what came to be called special relativity, and the, uh, and the generalization of that work which he released in a series of brief communications to the Prussian Academy of Sciences, one per week, every Thursday in the month of November, 1915. It was very busy. Every week he'd come in saying, I made some mistakes, I corrected things, here's my new, here's my new installment. Every once per week in November, 1915, and then of course wrote a longer kind of synthetic piece early in the, in the next year. Uh, we have an incredible documentary base with which to reconstruct his path, his intellectual path toward general relativity. We have, for example, his personal notebooks from critical years, 1912, 1913 in particular. Uh, here are some facsimile pages from that notebook. It's full of cross-outs. That always makes me feel better. Einstein made lots of errors in his mathematics. There's been an international team that has scoured these documents, uh, physicists and historians and philosophers uh, led by Jürgen Renn uh, at, in Berlin, the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, and a whole team. Uh, we also have, in addition to Einstein's notebooks, we have an extensive paper trail being um, analyzed and published uh, by the um, Einstein Papers Project headquartered in, at Caltech, again with an international team. So we have uh, Einstein's correspondence, we have letters to Einstein, we have referee reports, we have you know, sort of many bits and pieces of, of his daily life that, with which we can try to understand uh, moments of this path. So I'm going to spare you the details. He made lots of mistakes, he had many blind alleys, he convinced himself of things that he later said couldn't possibly be true. But at the end of that 10-year journey, he arrived at this form that we now uh, recognize immediately. This is a, a, a form brief enough to tweet. It's a marvelously compact expression that is meant to convey these deep and new insights into the nature of space, time, and gravity, where he's relating, as we know, the geometry, the curvature of space and time, the warp of space-time itself, to where the stuff is, to the distribution of matter and energy. This was um, the outcome of some extraordinary intellectual work uh, in, in fits and starts over a decade. At the end of that story, certainly not at the beginning, but by the end, Einstein had largely convinced himself that gravitation was nothing but geometry, a, a, an image that now many of us have come to see as quite natural. But it, was, it was an unexpected outcome of this work. In particular, Einstein would later argue there's no force of gravitation. The Earth doesn't move around the sun because the sun exerts a force tugging on it, as in the Newtonian account of gravity. But rather, the sun warps the surrounding space-time. The Earth has no choice but to move through a region of space-time that is no longer flat, and that affects its motion. It moves at, on as short a path as it possibly can through a space-time that's no longer flat. So the Earth falls in its orbit uh, because of the geometry of the system, not because of some tugging of, of these Newtonian-style forces. Okay. So I mentioned that Einstein brought this together. He culminated this, this work uh, in November of 1915. And of course, 
November of 1915, in the middle of Europe, that was a, a very, very uh, difficult time to be doing anything, let alone pursuing the, the nature of the physics of space and time. So the first part of, of my lecture today, I want to talk about how did other people come to learn about this new work? How did the ideas, the emerging ideas about relativity and, and space-time curvature and all the rest, how do they travel from Einstein's head to other members of the community, and how was this immediately overlaid and affected often quite deeply by uh, the state of, of, of war, by the outbreak of World War I and the involvement of many people in, in those new priorities? So let's first ask, how did ideas about Einstein's new work spread eastward? By this point, Einstein was in Berlin. He had moved to Berlin uh, in the middle of this work uh, in the spring of 19. 14, just before war broke out. And uh, we know, for example, from his diaries, from his correspondence, that even after war broke out, he was able to travel quite extensively within Germany. He was a, a highly regarded German civil servant, a, an employee of the uh, Prussian Academy of Sciences. But we know he made multi-week long visits, for example, to Göttingen. He would often stay as a personal house guest in the house of David Hilbert, the great mathematician. Uh, they were uh, very close, and they would uh, talk quite a lot about their shared interests. It was during these visits in the course of working toward general relativity that Einstein met a young Russian mathematician, Vesevlad Fredericks. Fredericks was in Göttingen as a young assistant to David Hilbert. He was a young mathematical physicist originally from St. Petersburg. When war broke out, when the First World War broke out, Fredericks was now a, a Russian mathematician in Germany. He was suddenly an enemy combatant. He was a civilian enemy, uh, and he was in, interred uh, in one of these uh, basically prisoner of war camps in Göttingen. Now, he was relatively well connected. David Hilbert was able to make sure that Fredericks was treated modestly well, but he couldn't leave. He was locked up and couldn't leave Göttingen. Throughout this period, Fredericks was able to uh, meet with Einstein bef before he was locked up. He was able to meet with Einstein when Einstein would come to visit. He was able to ask direct questions of Einstein in informal seminars, even in Hilbert's house. After he was uh, sent to, to the pri prison camp, uh, Hilbert was still able to meet with him. They could talk about things like relativity. After the end of the war, Fredericks was, was then allowed to leave. He repatriated back to St. Petersburg, of course, after the Russian Revolution. This had now become Petrograd. It's there that he actually started teaching the rudiments of general relativity to Alexander Friedman. Friedman, who was um, about to start finding exact solutions in a cosmological setting by the early 1920s, things like the Friedman's uh, equation and solutions we still use today. Fredericks and Friedman then taught a, a seminar together in Petersburg, and that's where they taught many of, what, of the people who would become the leading Russian experts uh, on the new material. Vladimir Fock, George Gamow, uh, Lev Landau, and then of course Landau taught everyone else. So this is how some of the earliest working knowledge of general relativity spread, to, spread eastward from Einstein's headquarters in Berlin. It was in this very, very um, halting uh, manner involving years spent in a, in a, basically in a prison camp. Um, not a very efficient transfer of ideas. Another effort to move uh, working knowledge of relativity eastward, one of Einstein's uh, friends and colleagues uh, from, from Berlin was Carl Schwarzschild, uh, a, an, both an, an observational astronomer and a mathematical physicist. Uh, Schwarzschild had been previously in Göttingen. He was part of the same uh, circle of colleagues. Uh, when war broke out, Schwarzschild, at age 40, volunteered for the German army. He was such a patriot, a German patriot, that he actually volunteered to serve as a, basically as an, as an infantryman uh, on, the, on the front. He was sent to the Russian front. Now, he was a member of the German army. Einstein was a German civil servant. They could still send mail to each other, even though uh, Schwarzschild was now basically on the Russian front. And again, there, many of their letters and postcards have survived. So we have some of the exchanges between Einstein and Schwarzschild. Once Schwarzschild had, was no longer in, uh, in Berlin, but in fact was in quite um, difficult circumstances. It was while basically taking a break from, from, the, from the rigors of trench warfare, of, 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 of warfare on the, on the Russian front, that Schwarzschild found the first exact solutions to Einstein's field equations. Einstein himself thought these equations would never admit exact solutions. Of course, we know they're highly nonlinear equations. There's no reason to think one could find closed form solutions. And Schwarzschild on the front, in the army under not very good conditions, found what we would now call the Schwarzschild solution, <clears throat> was able to communicate that back to Einstein. Einstein helped arrange for its publication. Within weeks of this great triumph, Schwarzschild contracted a very rare skin disease and died on the front. So here's effort number two to spread working knowledge eastward. <clears throat> a third effort to get knowledge of relativity to move away from Berlin, 
This again involves one of Einstein's immediate colleagues, a younger astronomer named Erwin Freundlich. Uh, Freundlich was very enthusiastic about the new work. He used to talk with Einstein quite a bit, even before Einstein had come to, to the kind of final version of the theory. He lear uh, Freundlich learned quite a lot. Einstein liked talking with Freundlich, who was again an observational astronomer, about ways they might find to actually uh, try to test these new ideas. Are there empirical astronomical tests of these otherwise very abstract notions like the warping of space-time? So uh, Einstein, as early as 1913, well before he'd come to, to the form of the field equations we'd recognize today, Einstein realized that if gravitation does have something deep to do with, with uh, geometry, with warping of space and time, then this should have an effect on the propagation of light. So Einstein began proposing to astronomers around the world, including to his neighbor, the young Freundlich, but also to American astronomers like George Ellery Hale and others, that maybe, just maybe, this light bending effect is, is real, and maybe it will be observable during, um, during an eclipse. So again, as we now know, the, the argument went as follows. Uh, one an astronomer could photograph a field of stars, distant stars, uh, at a time in the Earth's orbit when the sun was, was nowhere near the path of that light and then come back some months later and photograph the same field of stars, but at a time when the sun intervenes directly between this, that starlight and, uh, and us. Now, of course, one couldn't see that directly during, um, with the sun so bright, so one would wait for a, for a total eclipse, wait until the moon had moved to block most of the brightness of the sun, and then maybe one could photograph this distant field of stars with the glare of the sun temporarily obscured by the moon. This was the basic idea. And the argument was that the, as we now call it, the, the mass of the sun should lens the path of that starlight. So the starlight, uh, the stars would actually be in one location of the sky, but we would see their apparent position shift when the light was bent, was, was lensed by a large intervening mass like the sun. So one could compare st star fields, photographs of the same area of the sky, uh, when the sun was nowhere nearby and during an eclipse, see if there had been, in fact, this, this, me this perhaps measurable shift. Freundlich thought that was terrific. Uh, Einstein helped, helped uh, raise funds from the Prussian Academy for Freundlich to be able to, to conduct one of these tests. It turned out the, um, the, the, the next uh, sort of prime viewing location, the next uh, eclipse that would be visible from the continent was to be held in, uh, in August of 1914. Freundlich and uh, several assistants set off for Crimea. Uh, and as soon as they arrived, war broke out. They were immediately captured as enemy combatants. Their equipment was uh, stolen and they spent six weeks uh, in prison. So, and they were not able to, to measure, and after all that, they couldn't even measure the eclipse. So they were, they were eventually released, but here was another effort, a rather halting effort, to try to gather knowledge about uh, the warping of space and time during very, very dramatic times here on Earth. So another foiled attempt. What about moving knowledge of relativity westward from Berlin? So again, we know from Einstein's extensive correspondence and travel diaries and these things that he was able to travel to neutral countries even after war had broken out. So again, he's based in Berlin. He's effectively a German civil servant because of his uh, position with the Prussian Academy. So he couldn't travel, for example, to France, but he could travel to the Netherlands. And we know that he did. In fact, he made multiple trips to Leiden, partly because he had a very dear friend there, Paul Ehrenfest. And in fact, by this point, several of Einstein's own former students had also settled uh, and were members of Ehrenfest's group. So Einstein made multiple trips, lengthy trips, a week or two at a time, to Leiden during this period, even after war had broken out. It was during those trips that he met Willem de Sitter, uh, much like Schwarzschild, both an observational astronomer and a mathematical physicist. And now, during these one and two week long visits, Einstein was able to tutor de Sitter directly, face to face, in these developing ideas about what would co coalesce as general relativity and the warping of space-time. So Einstein was able to uh, engage directly, personally, informally with colleagues like de Sitter uh, because he was allowed to travel to Leiden, even though he couldn't travel, for example, to Paris at this point. One place he couldn't, certainly could have no interaction uh, was, with the, was with Britain after word broken out. So not only could he not travel personally, the mail uh, wouldn't get through, the journals were um, embargoed, uh, there was a naval blockade. So there was a tremendous rupture in communication between scientists in Germany and Britain after war had broken out. So we know that uh, Arthur Eddington, another observational astronomer and mathematical physicist, uh, was not able to learn about these new work from Einstein directly, uh, or even from the journals, but he was able to receive mail from Willem de Sitter. 
So de Sitter was in a neutral country, he was in the Netherlands, de Sitter could send mail that would get to Cambridge or to London. Uh, Einstein couldn't. And so de Sitter, who learned about this material directly from Einstein, could then write very lengthy English language primers for Eddington, and Eddington could then slowly, slowly try to get up to speed with a new set of ideas. Eddington was in some sense the best, one of the best prepared, prepared people on the planet to learn this material. He was trained in the highly formal um, uh, mathematical skills of the Cambridge tripost tradition as well as being an observational astronomer. He was in some sense, m should have been most able to learn this material quickly, but in fact he was restricted to these sort of um, correspondence course type mailings from de Sitter. Um, now he had many reasons to be excited by this new work. Eddington was uh, deeply curious about the new ideas about uh, gravitation and warping spacetime. But we also know, and this is work largely from my, my friend, uh, the historian Matt Stanley, who wrote a, a very interesting book about Eddington. Eddington was personally uh, very, very committed to trying to reestablish scientific connections that had been so threatened and even ruptured by, by wartime. So Eddington was uh, a devoted Quaker, religious Quaker, and he was also um, an outspoken pacifist and conscientious objector. That was a very brave thing to be in Britain. So at this point during the First World War, conscientious objectors in Britain, whether for religious or other reasons, who, who did not want to fight in the war effort, many of them were jailed for the duration of the war. Others were sent um, to the front to, to uh, work with sort of ambulance care and so on, very dangerous work. Uh, Eddington had much more powerful local friends in uh, London, and it was determined that his national service, since he refused to contribute directly to uh, the war effort, his national service would be preparing an expedition to test these new ideas that he learned about indirectly from de Sitter. He would prepare an eclipse expedition, and that would be his service uh, in lieu of either uh, volunteering to fight or serving um, at the front. That's a pretty good gig, right? If you're going to sit out the war, uh, it's a nice to be able to prepare a well-funded scientific expedition. So again, as we all know, uh, he did uh, organize this, uh, this, this scientific effort. There were actually two teams. One went to uh, the island of Tenerife off the western coast of Africa. Another went to Brazil. Um, the, uh, the war ended, uh, you know, armistice was signed in November of 1918. The eclipse, as they calculated well in advance, was uh, in May of 1919, roughly six months later. Roughly six months after that, the team had uh, boiled down their data and computed their, completed their calculations. And at a very dramatic joint meeting of the Royal Society and the Royal Astronomical Society in London, Eddington mounted the stage and announced to, to great fanfare that Einstein was right. That the, the prediction for the bending of light during the solar eclipse had been vindicated. Newton, the great giant of English science, had been displaced by an English team testing the work of, uh, in some sense, an enemy, the German-based scientist Albert Einstein. This, of course, was worldwide news even before Twitter and Facebook. This somehow made it around the globe almost instantaneously. There's a famous front page headline from the New York Times uh, reporting on Eddington's announcement with the headline, Lights All Askew in the Heavens, Men of Science More or Less Agog Over Results of Eclipse Expeditions, Einstein Theory Triumphs, it's my favorite part, Stars Not Where They Seemed or Were Calculated to Be, But Nobody Need Worry. It's the best part. <laughs> I like that. Uh, not long after that, uh, Einstein departed on, on a worldwide tour, uh, and one of his first stops was to New York City, which he'd never visited before. Uh, he was greeted as a, really as a hero. This is the trip in which he met film stars like Charlie Chaplin. He was greeted with this sort of open, open uh, car ride per, um, sort of parade to the streets of New York City. Uh, this is what made Einstein a celebrity. Eddington's announcement in 1919, virtually to the day, almost to the day, one year after the armistice that had ended this very, very bloody war, that catapulted Einstein to a kind of fame that, that he'd uh, never enjoyed before. He was, he was very, cer certainly in the English language, that's right. In fact, again, uh, both, both Matt Stanley, another colleague of mine, um, Alistair Sponsel, has done some really fascinating work, actually, on uh, Eddington. I mean, worth, let me just say a few more words about that. Eddington was very, we might say, media savvy. He was a very good writer, and he also knew how to keep ideas in, in the public view. So he would write first-person testimonials all throughout the preparation before the actual eclipse even happened. He would also write <clears throat> anonymous essays that make it look like lots of other people were excited about this as well. <laughs> the guy was no dope, right? Um, yeah, and he, he also, I mean, it's also interesting scientifically, he, he 
he, he, he made it seem uh, that there was really a showdown. It's either Newton or Einstein, right? Uh, and in fact, there, there are many outcomes that one could have found, but he already, bef long before they set out for, for the expedition, he said, there are two choices we are faced here, right? He, he really did a marvelous job of setting up the, the anticipation for the result. So yes, he was, a, a, even before his, his later books would come out in 1920, 1922, he was very active even before then, yeah. Okay, so, so uh, this, as I say, catapults Einstein into fame. Einstein, around this time, gives an interview with the London Times, and he says quite cleverly, uh, today I'm described in Germany as a German servant and in England as a Swiss Jew, because, of course, the English couldn't give Germans credit. Should it ever be my fate to be represented as a bete noir, should the work not indeed hold up, I should, on the contrary, become a Swiss Jew for the Germans and a German savant for the English. And he closed with a wink. This is another application of the theory of relativity. It's cute. Alas, once again, his, his sort of empirical prediction was borne out. So within six months of the Eddington announcement, uh, there was indeed an enormous backlash in Germany beginning in April of 1920, just months after the Eddington eclipse results were announced. There was not just an anti-Einstein campaign. That's sort of un unsurprising. He was an outspoken socialist pacifist who denounced the German war effort in public. Uh, he was Jewish. Of course, they didn't like Einstein. But uh, certain political opportunists rented out sporting arenas and opera houses, I mean, enormous venues, to denounce relativity, down with warping space-time. And these were enormous, often raucous affairs. The, the leading uh, sort of presences on stage the leading presences on stage were two German Nobel laureates, experimentalists, uh, Johannes Stark and Philip Lenard. Uh, many ironies abound. Stark, in fact, had, was editor of a review journal who had invited Einstein in 1907 to write a review of Einstein's own work on relativity because Stark didn't think he was getting enough uh, notice on special relativity at the time. Uh, Philip Lenard won his Nobel Prize for experimental work on the photoelectric effect. Of course, Einstein received his Nobel Prize for a theoretical description or explanation of the photoelectric effect. And yet, by this point, by April 1920, Stark, Lenard, and, and many kind of behind-the-scenes operators were convinced that not just Einstein, but relativity was, was, was really a horror show. <clears throat> So they began uh, speaking at these rallies, as I say, these large ra public rallies. They also began publishing uh, pamphlets, articles in newspapers. Ultimately, their efforts uh, culminated in a series of books. Here's a, a later publication by Lenard, long study, Große Naturforscher. Uh, it was translated into English as Great Men of Science, a history of science in biographical form. The main argument of this enormously thick volume by Philip Lenard was that all the greatest discoveries in physics and mathematics have been made by racially pure Aryans, by which he meant Galileo and Descartes and Isaac Newton, and Teutonic all. And if you didn't believe him, then he actually included portraits. So you could see from Newton's facial features, he didn't have a so-called Jewish nose, that clearly he was of, of appropriate racial stock, and therefore, Newtonian physics was indeed um, appropriate for proud uh, Germans to study, unlike this garbage coming from uh, Jewish theorists like Albert Einstein. So this was a complicated uh, and, and very voluminous series of, of writings and sort of attacks. I'll boil it down. It came down to two steps. The first step was Einstein's work is disgusting. It is repugnant to the, to the Aryan sensibility, step one. Step two, we did it first. It's both disgusting and we want credit for it. It's a very curious way of arguing. This is as early as 1920, yeah. It, no, that's right, that, exactly. So there was a whole series of writings. So this, this, there was a later one uh, from Lenard. Yes, yes, yes. I'll, I'll give some examples of that in a moment, yeah. Uh, it, 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 it amplified, it, it grew in volume, both page count and, and, and outlandishness. But some of these early, ta some, of the, some of the phrasings you can find even in these earliest, early 1920s. Yeah. But before there was even a Nazi party. These were, some of these were rallies that helped indeed nucleate what would become a Nazi party. Uh, there were some, as I say, some of these sort of opportunists behind the scenes, someone like Paul Weiland, who were, who were eager to, to, to foment political change, and they thought these rallies might help get supporters excited. So let's look at that first part. Uh, it's disgusting. The work is, is repugnant to the Aryan sensibility. Here's an example from a pamphlet uh, well before 1943. I don't remember the exact date, but this was an earlier one. And the argument was that the concept of force, which was introduced by Aryan scientists, again, like Galileo and Descartes and Newton, uh, 
obviously arises from a personal experience of human labor, this pamphleteer wrote, a mathematician, of manual creation, which has been and is the essential content of the life of Aryan man. This was part of what would become a kind of Nazi ideology of the, the tot mention, the, the men of action, that they had worked the land, they felt force in their bones from an agrarian kind of uh, lifestyle, and only an effete Jew, they said, like Einstein, could dispense with a notion like force because they had clearly were, were coming at it from the wrong direction. I say that's from well before 1943. That's an earlier example. Meanwhile, another early example uh, of the sort of we did it first part, there had been a, a, a little known uh, German speaking naturalist early in the 19th century, well before the age of Einstein, uh, in 1803, named Johann Soldner, who had written actually a very clever Newtonian derivation of light bending. This is before the wave theory of light had really taken over. This is, uh, Soldner was using Newtonian gravity, but also Newton's theories of light. Newton thought that light was a stream of corpuscles, of particles. And so Soldner said, basically, could you calculate the change in momentum of a little bit of matter, a little corpuscle flowing uh, near the sun? And indeed, he said, there should be a bending effect. The, gra the Newtonian gravity of the sun should change the uh, momentum of that little corpuscle of light. Now, the fact that quantitatively he found one half the Einsteinian value was a nicety on which the Gestapo didn't linger. What, what mattered was a, a good, proper Aryan researcher, as it was then later uh, recast, had derived the very result for which Einstein was being celebrated around the world. This notion of light being bent by uh, gravitation, as evidenced, for example, by the Eclipse expedition, that was basically stolen, they argued, from a proper German researcher. They managed to have his 1803 publication republished in 1921 in a Gestapo uh, journal. So it's disgusting, and he stole it from us. Okay, there's a lot more to be said. And again, there's a, a tremendous amount of scholarship by many historians now, some quite recent books, very interesting works, on the kind of uh, anti-Einstein and anti-relativity campaigns. That's just to give a taste of how, right on the heels of this great excitement from 1919, there was already a rather dramatic and sort of politically inflected backlash. Let me move on uh, to more recent times. So we can plot the number of publications in the universe, or at least on Earth, on aspects of general relativity over time. We see uh, some, some rise, a modest rise after the excitement of relativity. There's still not a lot happening. There are many, many confounding factors here. Not long after the Eclipse expedition, of course, many scientists, many physicists around the world got very interested and excited about the emerging ideas of quantum theory, later of nuclear physics. That's being compounded with, once uh, the, the Nazis did take over uh, in Germany starting in 1933, it became illegal to teach so-called Jewish physics in the German universities. Uh, we had the, what had been the largest and most extensive community of experts on relativity was dispersed uh, rather quickly uh, within the German scene, and scientists elsewhere were excited about or drawn to other ideas. You have a mixture of pushes and pulls, such that relativity never really took off. Uh, of course, there was a, uh, many other priorities during the wartime years. Publications were, were especially low. And then something extraordinary starts to happen in the decade or so after uh, the Second World War. In fact, it doesn't stop there. As we know, it would just keep, <laughs> it would keep rising and rising and rising. So what I want to shift focus on now is some of, these, uh, some of these shifts after the Second World War that helped bring relativity back into focus. Uh, and again, I, I, I want to emphasize this was done not outside the worlds of politics, but in some sense thoroughly enmeshed within it. So I'm going to turn now to, uh, to some examples from the United States. <clears throat> One of them very close to home for me at MIT. So MIT, as you may know, entered the war effort one year earlier than the United States. So war, of course, had broken out in Europe uh, as early as September 1939. But in one year after that, in early autumn 1940, well before the United States declared war after the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, before that, MIT entered the war effort by uh, clandestinely building uh, a secret laboratory on campus that would eventually become the Allied headquarters for radar. This was aided enormously by a British expedition, British team that came over, again, highly secret, met with um, both officials and scientists and engineers in the United States, because the Brits had made great progress on, on short wavelength radar, uh, but then they were suffering a bombardment. They were, were not able to, to carry this further. So basically, MIT took over that project. Radar had existed as a military technology in the 20s and 30s, but short wavelength radar, with which one could pick out, for example, a periscope of a German U-boat on the ocean, small wavelength, that was quite new and a great technical challenge. 
So this became an enormous effort uh, headquartered at MIT. It rivaled in personnel and in budget the Manhattan Project. It was a sprawling, sprawling effort. They wound up uh, designing and building prototypes for several dozen distinct types of radars, ground to air, ground to ground, air to air, many, many things. They had a training school on campus to, to bring uh, military members to campus to learn how to use the new systems. Uh, it was often said, especially around MIT, that the nuclear weapons might have ended the war, uh, but radar had won it. This was how it was seen, at least as a point of local pride around MIT. This was seen as such a successful cooperation between the uh, armed forces and uh, higher education that at MIT there was an effort right after the end of the war to continue this cooperation. And so there was a post-war uh, continuation of the radar facility and something that exists to this day it was founded called the Research Laboratory for Electronics, or RLE. That was founded, again, funded largely by the military branches to have a continued um, point of contact between scientists and engineers working on defense-relevant technologies like radar and, and similar things, but still uh, in touch with the military sponsors. Before too long, the nature of the threat began to shift. So one designs certain kinds of radar systems if the target is uh, our slow-moving aircraft in formation, bombers. One needs different kinds of uh, radars and, and networks of radars if you think the target's going to be single missiles, a single intercontinental ballistic missile, not many, many enormous aircraft flying slowly and in formation. So this led to an expansion of MIT's efforts in radar, the, an expansion that eventually outgrew even the campus facilities. This is when, uh, again, largely with funding from the US Air Force, MIT founded a, a companion laboratory, the Lincoln Laboratory, in the suburbs um, a few miles away from campus, and again, exists to this day. The, the main um, uh, priority, the main focus for Lincoln Laboratory was to continue working on ever more sophisticated radar systems, especially for the missile age, not just for aircraft. Uh, one of the high priority items there was a project that was called BEMUSE, Ballistic Missile Early Warning System. I love that, that sounds like as if it's so funny, BEMUSING. Uh, the idea here was to build very powerful radars and conduct narrow pencil beam surveys that would be scanning the horizon to try to look for an early telltale radar blip that might be a Soviet missile early in its launch phase. That would give roughly half an hour of warning before that missile would arrive in uh, Washington or New York or somewhere else. So this was uh, one of the high priority projects at Lincoln, uh, quite a, quite a, 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 quite a a distinction from the wartime efforts in, in the radar that had been worked on before. This created an enormous volume of literature, much of it classified even to this day, a significant amount of it unclassified or since declassified, technical reports on every aspect. They had to figure out both the, the, the beam characteristics and also, because this was meant to be a network, how do you coordinate many different signals, or also early efforts in real-time electronic computation, which was quite new in the, uh, the mid-1950s. How do you get many, many radar signals from different stations to be coordinated, and how do you predict what's going to happen next? That was an enormous technical challenge. They had new equipment on hand, not just personnel. They had this uh, millstone radar, which was built. It came online just in time to actually uh, detect the Sputnik satellite. So the millstone radar, as part of Lincoln Laboratory, an enormously powerful radar system, was actually operational just in time to ping. This is, this is the millstone ping of the Sputnik satellite from October 1957. To give you a sense of scale, this is a pickup truck. This is a very enormous radar system. Uh, and uh, one of the early recruits to this now sprawling operation was the young physicist named Erwin Shapiro, again, a name likely well known to, to many of you. Shapiro had studied physics and mathematics as an undergraduate. He did a PhD in nuclear physics, theoretical nuclear physics at Harvard, and then, according to his own later recollections, he took a job at Lincoln Laboratory in part to avoid the draft. Uh, the U.S. had just kind of arranged a, a, a kind of stalemate with, uh, uh, during the Korean War. There was still an active military draft, and Shapiro took uh, a job doing technically interesting work nearby at this MIT, MIT Lincoln Laboratory. And his job was to work as part of this BEMUSE project. In particular, his job was to try to figure out efficient routines, efficient algorithms, to predict from, say, two radar pings where an object might be going, to extrapolate a trajectory, which would be, of course, quite important if this was an incoming missile. <clears throat> so how do you know if this new kind of coordinated system would work? There were, thankfully, very few Soviet missiles crossing the horizon heading for the United States. Thankfully, of course, there were zero. Uh, 
So how do you know that the radars would work, that the integration of radar signals would work, that the computation of the uh, projection for uh, a trajectory would work? How do you know this new kind of thing would be effective, especially if you don't have sort of a real-time uh, system to practice on? Well, again, very smart, uh, enterprising scientists and engineers at Lincoln invented the field or helped invent the field of planetary radar astronomy. They would send signals from these very powerful radars to the inner planets, Mercury and Venus, and detect the return echo, partly to learn more about the planets, but largely, as the internal documents make clear from Lincoln vis-a-vis -vis their Air Force uh, sponsors, this was a great way to make sure that the defense applications were going to work properly when needed. So by sending signals to the planet Mercury, they could learn how to, to receive very faint echoes from very small targets on the sky uh, and also do things like real-time estimation of, of, um, of trajectories. So this was, this was justified and really was, was, was pursued in large measure as target practice for uh, early missile warning defense. And again, it was not just the radars themselves, but every single aspect of this, of this new integrated system. What type of memory storage do you use in these very early days of electronic computation? Uh, how do you do any of the kind of digital data crunching and so on? This is all quite new and quite challenging. It was in the midst of all this work uh, that Shapiro, Erwin Shapiro, attended a classified briefing on MIT's main campus. He came in from the, from the laboratory in the suburbs to the main campus. This was uh, a, a not infrequent sort of meeting. There were, of course, many classified projects going on throughout campus, both on the main campus and Lincoln, some sponsored by the Air Force, some sponsored by the Navy, and so on. And so periodically, the sponsoring military branches would invite members of, these, of the MIT faculty who had appropriate clearance, who, who could handle secret and classified information, to give technical briefings to each other in hopes that they could help each other out if they got stuck. And so it was during one of these where Shapiro came to the main campus and heard a report by a colleague in a totally different department, an electrical engineer named George Stroke. Stroke was not working on, on radars. He wasn't working on the Air Force project. In fact, he was consulting on the US Navy for the new Polaris missile system. These were submarine-based missiles that would be launched and would have an, in, uh, an inertial guidance system. And so the missiles were supposed to find their way to their target. But in order to initialize, to figure out where they were on the surface of the Earth, once this missile splashed up from the submarine, the idea was, it was quite ambitious, to use an early predecessor of a kind of GPS system, a network of satellites, and the, the missile would sort of receive some signal from some satellite, and that would initialize, it would tell it where it was, and then the inertial guidance on board could take over. So Stro Stroke, was, the engineer, was working on this project. So part of his challenge was to figure out anything that could affect the propagation of light of these ele electromagnetic signals that are going to be so important for setting, if you like, the initial conditions for this missile. So he did a literature review. He went to MIT's libraries. He got out lots of books on things like relativity to ask what could possibly affect the propagation of light. What do we have to worry about in engineering this military system? He included a paragraph in his briefing, or two paragraphs, on this little-known notion from general relativity. A, he reviews the Michelson-Morley experiment. He does all this interesting stuff about special relativity. And then he has a very brief section on general relativity, going back to early textbooks by uh, the, the Wolfgang Pauli handbook and other books from, from before the war, as well as uh, uh, Peter Bergman's book from, from the early 1940s. And he finds in these textbooks the prediction from general relativity that gravitation should affect the speed of light, not just its path, that there could be a slowing down of the propagation of light in a strong gravitational field. We would describe that differently today. That's a highly coordinate dependent way of describing it. But that's exactly how the textbooks uh, wrote about it in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, early 40s. So Stroke says, well, this could be in effect as well. That this, this signal coming from some satellite could be, could be affected by the strong gravitation. Uh, and we have to take that into account to adjust for where that missile really is. He concludes happily one doesn't have to. This gravitational effect is, of course, extremely tiny near the surface of the Earth. So you can neglect it. But he includes it in his review. That's the first time that Erwin Shapiro had heard of any of this stuff. Shapiro had done a PhD in nuclear theory. He'd never taken a single course in general relativity. There were very few courses in the United States on the subject at the time. This was intriguing to him, especially because he was mostly working with these planetary radar astronomers who actually had access to stronger sources of gravitation, not just the surface of the Earth. So this idea lodges in Shapiro's mind. He goes back to Lincoln Laboratory, and he realizes that he has the exact machinery and team and know-how to try to test his very curious idea that gravitation could slow the propagation of light. 
They were already sending radar signals from the Earth to the inner planets. And Shapiro quite brilliantly realized if they sent the signal during superior conjunction, not just inferior conjunction, then that electromagnetic pulse, the radar beam, would travel through a relatively strong gravitational field of the sun and travel back again. So if this relativistic effect, this, this um, what we now call the Shapiro time delay, if this, if this effect of gravitation on the speed of propagation is to be there at all, then the group at Lincoln Laboratory, the defense team trying to, to, uh, to detect incoming Soviet missiles, maybe they could find this. With help from uh, a nearby expert in general relativity, um, Stanley Dezer, who taught very close to here, uh, Shapiro worked out the first calculation, the predicted effect for, for solar system tests. He wrote up a very, very lovely technical report from the laboratory, laying all this out, and then wrote a typically cryptic article in PRL, which to this day no one can understand. I can't. Uh, but this, the report from the lab is actually qu quite lovely and very clear. Um, and in fact, he predicted there should be a relativistic effect, and it could be testable a kind of modern-day eclipse expedition using these defense system radars uh, that were built to detect Soviet missiles. The echo would be 27 orders of magnitude attenuated. The amplitude of that return wave would be barely perceptible. But that's exactly the kind of weak signal that the, that the Air Force team at Lincoln was prepared to, to collect. Um, the entire predicted signal would be 200 microseconds. So after sending that radar pulse to Mercury and back, the entire relativistic effect would be on the order of 200 microseconds. That's a thousand times quicker than the blink of an eye. That's very short. But again, the team at Lincoln had exceptionally sensitive electronics and timing devices precisely because they had to worry about microsecond type uh, differences. So this is, they, were, they were in the right place to try to actually do this test. So indeed, uh, after collecting data on several uh, um, orbits, both for Mercury and Venus, Shapiro led the group to ultimately uh, conclude there is indeed a measurable time delay, exactly as predicted by relativity, and for years and years and years to come, the Shapiro time delay test was the quantitatively most precise measure of the warping of space-time. Not just that space-time warps, but how much per unit mass, and in fact it matches the, the general relativity uh, predictions remarkably well. So a brilliant kind of offshoot from a very serious, highly high-priority military project helped us all learn about the warping of space and time. I'll go through one last example so, somewhat quickly. That previous example was partly about instrumentation and teams and, and high priority work uh, on the, in the kind of experimental domain. This last example is now shifting to, um, to more theoretical work and it focuses on the, on the efforts of uh, Bryce DeWitt, again a name uh, likely known to, to you here. So DeWitt uh, was one of the rare people who actually studied relativity, general relativity, in graduate school in the 1940s. He completed his dissertation at Harvard under the direction of Julian Schwinger in 1949. DeWitt had set for himself the very ambitious project of quantizing gravity. He didn't succeed, no one has really, uh, but nonetheless he learned an awful lot about the interaction between uh, gravitation and electromagnetism and so on. After his thesis, he did a postdoc at the prestigious Institute for Advanced Study, where Einstein by that point was. He then took a fellowship to the new Tata Institute for Fundamental Research in uh, Mumbai, and then simply couldn't find an academic position. He worked on a topic that was very peculiar, by American standards at least, gravitation itself, let alone efforts to quantize it. He then took himself out of the American network by going for a year or two to Mumbai. He could not find uh, the kind of position he was hoping for. The one job he got at the last minute was at a brand new laboratory that was just then set up in Northern California, the Livermore Laboratory, whose sole purpose was to design hydrogen bombs. This was meant to be uh, not a companion so much as a competitor to the Los Alamos Laboratory. It was headed up by, uh, or it was, it was founded at the insistence of Edward Teller. So DeWitt arrived in, as, as soon as the laboratory opened, September 1952. And he was sent to what they called the leper colony, because he didn't have clearance yet. So he had to be quarantined from all the secrets. Uh, eventually he got his clearance. He was told before he could touch any classified material to read two books. To read a book by the mathematicians, um, uh, Courant and Friedrichs, on shock waves and supersonic flow. And to read Chandrasekhar's classic book on stellar astrophysics. And he wasn't told why to read those particular books about radiation pressure and shock waves, but he quickly learned, uh, figured out why. As soon as he got his clearance, he was tutored by Edward Teller himself in the still brand new ideas about uh, how hydrogen bombs might work. Edward Teller and Stan Ulam had just come up with this different idea uh, in the spring of 1951, just on the heels of all this work. 
The idea was to use uh, a, a fission bomb, a, 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 a plutonium sort of fission uh, trigger, to try to induce nuclear fusion reactions, not just by using the heat from the first bomb, but critically by using the radiation pressure as well. That was really the newest part of this teller Ulam idea, highly classified at the time, details still classified. But we have come to learn since then the main insight was to use, um, to sort of channel the radiation pressure from that exploding pri fission primary. So the question became, uh, how, would such designs work? If so, how, how could you figure out the optimal design? What would be efficiencies? What types of fuel? What balance between deuterium and tritium and so on would you use? What's the optimal uh, uh, configuration? All these questions remained after this sort of sketch of the teller ulam idea had been put forward. And that's what Teller set uh, DeWitt to work on. Uh, he had uh, tools like the, an, an electronic programmable computer, so the UNIVAC, the first electronic computer being delivered to the laboratory uh, a few months after DeWitt had arrived. This is what iPhones used to look like. An enormous uh, machine, uh, very rare still at the time. So uh, in order to account, in order to study these sort of designs for potential H-bombs, DeWitt quickly realized he couldn't just use a spherical code. He couldn't use a one-dimensional code, one dimension of, of space. Radio, radial symmetry won't ever get you what seemed to be most critical for these things, which is a cylindrical symmetry to be able to focus uh, that, that radiation pressure. So we knew he had to use at least, a, at least two spatial dimensions in these new numerical simulations. Now, people had been, uh, had been working on this at Los Alamos uh, even before the computer arrived at um, Livermore, and most of them, all of them, kept using Eulerian coordinates, which is what is a natural thing to start with. They would use basically a kind of Cartesian grid. They would fix uh, lattice points in two dimensions of space and try to follow matter and radiation flowing through it. Of course, they were immediately stymied. These codes would never got anywhere for several problems. The, the, there were many types of materials inside these hypothetical weapons that would have different burn rates. They would have different equations of state. And so radiation and shock waves would travel inhomogeneously through this through this uh, device. So that meant that at every time step, at any given moment in time, the boundaries between these types of materials would become deformed, right? Different, different uh, they, they would flow differently over time. They would move inhomogeneously over time. And perhaps most important, the things that were of most physical relevance for the, for the task at hand, the propagation of radiation and shock waves, those traveled at such high speeds that they would exit the lattice too quickly. They couldn't make a lattice of an enormous number of points and so radiation that starts here would just exit the simulation too fast. So they, these early efforts to simulate the insides of an H-bomb were getting nowhere. So DeWitt, who'd been trained in relativity, said, why don't you adopt a different coordinate system, which is the first thing a relativist would likely say. So DeWitt said, let's use Lagrangian coordinates, uh, if you'd like, a kind of co-moving coordinate system. Let's, let's attach coordinate points to, to test bodies and watch the whole material flow. Uh, wouldn't, that be, uh, wouldn't that be more effective? So, of course, if you map the Lagrangian coordinates at any given moment in time, with respect to the original uh, Eulerian grid, it's a mess. But to it, say, well, we just, just perform a coordinate transformation. The Lagrangian coordinates are just as legitimate as any other coordinate system. Again, a central lesson from relativity. So why don't we set up the computer simulations to use two dimensions of space, but let's treat our two dimensions a little more carefully in the Lagrangian grid. Uh, so as he, uh, DeWitt recalled years later at a, a celebration for one of his uh, colleagues from Livermore, Jim Wilson, DeWitt said, one evening, breaking the rules of the laboratory, and indeed very likely breaking the laws of the federal government, United States, um, I decided to work on the problem at home. Highly classified work he wrote on his kitchen table. Can't do that. Uh, actually writing things down on paper, he said. I took the hydrodynamic equations in two dimensions and differenced them. But now having made this critical coordinate transformation and showing why uh, the Jacobi and all these things actually take care of themselves quite neatly. Uh, and in fact, he did do that. I found these papers in DeWitt's personal archive at the University of Texas. Uh, I don't know if you can read that. It says detonation hydrodynamics. And it starts by laying out uh, Eulerian coordinates, then Lagrangian coordinates, then performing in these little adorable sketches on the back page uh, exactly how to transform these kind of curvy linear interfaces between different sorts of material in the original grid into the Lagrangian grid, where things again look quite regular, quite rectilinear in the, in the appropriate coordinate system. He went back the next day to Edward Teller, said, I must be missing something. This looks quite straightforward. Teller said, that's great. He arranged for DeWitt to give a, a, an impromptu lecture for the whole laboratory that afternoon. He was one of the newest recruits to the lab and suddenly was the expert 
on 2D hydrocode. Uh, and indeed, he wrote, DeWitt wrote up a, a technical report that was later uh, uh, declassified from around this time, just laying this out very clearly. He was assigned to work directly with a computer programmer, a person who would actually implement this on the UNIVAC, and they worked around the clock. And he explained again why the Lagrangian approach was, was clearly the way to go if you need to do two dimensions of space and you can't rely on radial symmetry. Uh, about a year and a half, two years after that, uh, both Br Bryce DeWitt and his, and his wife, uh, the great mathematical physicist Cecile Moret DeWitt, they received uh, offers to move to the University of North Carolina. They left Livermore. Uh, and then one of the first things they did was host this now very famous, very important conference on the role of gravitation in physics. This was trying to get together in one place many of the experts from di who were dispersed across Europe as well as the United States, kind of all working separately to say there's a community of people who care about general relativity. Let's come together and work. And in the proceedings, there's this very curious set of comments. The, the discussions were recorded. This was not part of a formal talk. This is part of the kind of between talk, um, uh, between lecture discussions where the, the, the uh, proceedings record. DeWitt pointed out some difficulties encountered in high-speed computational techniques. Remember, virtually no one else had access to electronic computers yet. These were still extremely rare. In the United States, at least, they were almost exclusively used at the weapons laboratories. Any nonlinear hydro calculations are always done in so-called Lagrangian coordinates. So the mesh points move with the material instead of being fixed in space, which DeWitt alone in that room knew about. When applying to gravitational radiation, you don't want the radiation to move out quickly from the range of your computer. This was obvious to do it because he just spent some very intense years working on uh, classified hydrocodes for the HBOM project. And he says, if you want to simulate things like gravitational radiation, here's how you do it. You adopt Lagrangian coordinate systems for your numerical computation. A few years later, he indeed began to implement this. Uh, here's his handwritten Fortran code. Uh, he then began to build a program, both a computer program, but more importantly, a pedagogical program. So at first he was stymied because there was very little access to electronic computers outside the weapons labs. But over the next decade or so, it became more easy for even academics to get access to reasonably high-powered machines. This became even easier for DeWitt when he moved from North Carolina to uh, Austin, Texas. Texas had just purchased one of these monsters, the CDC 6600, uh, that could perform three million floating point operations per second, which sounds like a lot to realize it's <clears throat> about 10 billion times fewer than what people could do today, computers can do today. But that was finally able, uh, DeWitt and his, and his graduate students were finally able to start implementing some of these ideas in what becomes known as numerical relativity, in particular this idea of, of using very particular kinds of coordinate systems to not use, in this case, Gaussian normal coordinates, but in fact to have always this explicit shift vector which was really implementing a lot of what DeWitt had worked out <clears throat> back in the 50s in terms of the, um, the, the, the kind of co-moving coordinates. So here's an example from Larry Smarr's dissertation, one among this now kind of a series of, of students working on this with DeWitt, where he starts drawing pictures exactly like what DeWitt had drawn in a rather different context earlier. Um, <clears throat> so Smarr in particular then starts really catalyzing a network of people. Smarr uh, helped coach some of uh, uh, DeWitt's later students like uh, Kenneth Epley, uh, and then uh, when Smarr became himself a young professor um, at, uh, in Illinois, <clears throat> he worked with a series of colleagues there to propose out of the blue to the U.S. National Science Foundation uh, that, the, that the civilian sectors of the federal government should fund supercomputers because these are necessary for all kinds of scientific research. And as they go through in their proposal, until that point, especially in the United States, the sort of high power, high performance computing was almost exclusively still at the weapons laboratories. This is in 1983, let alone in 1953 when DeWitt began working on these things. So he makes this, this proposal that we need this kind of electronic power not just behind the fence for classified projects. And indeed, this is successful. The NSF uh, starts underwriting what becomes the National um, Center for Supercomputer Applications, really growing out of SMAR in this network that he, that he builds. SMAR also, as many of you will probably know, helps to catalyze an international group to work more concertedly on numerical relativity. And it's out of this group's effort that we eventually get things like numerical relativity that we can use for um, template matching for LIGO and all the rest. So this, this tool that we now sort of take for granted uh, that is so immensely powerful for us today, we can trace its roots back uh, to, to the earliest days of, uh, of Bryce DeWitt's efforts in this classified project um, at the Livermore Laboratory. Okay, let me, let me wrap up. 
So what does it mean to try to tell a political history of gravity, to try to embed our understanding of, of relativity in the world, not remove it from the world? We, we might mean several things by politics. One thing we might mean by politics would be something like um, symbols, ideology, representation. That certainly is on, on display in earnest with these uh, writings, for example, by Philip Lennard. But I think there's, there's more than, than only kind of symbols or, or statements in politics. Politics is also about um, information and access. Who can even uh, hear about a technical briefing, for example, as Shapiro did at that uh, MIT meeting? Who's even invited in the room? Uh, who can move, uh, like uh, as Einstein uh, could to some degree during the war, who could move to, from place to place to visit with colleagues? Who can send correspondence during wartime? So these are all thoroughly political uh, axes of scientific work as well. And finally, what about resources and infrastructure? Who has access to enormous machines like the Millstone radar or the uh, Univac computer? And how are the, how, who will make decisions about how we are going to share uh, or make these resources available. I think when we take this expanded view of politics, it's not just about kind of right-left ideology, but it's also about infrastructure and resources and priorities. Then I think we get to, we begin to see a, a, a history of relativity that is, that is thoroughly political, uh, in some ways both advancing and in other ways retarding the study. This all came home to me in a very, very direct way a little over 10 years ago. I, I wrote with Alan Guth a, a brief review article uh, on inflationary cosmology. This is for the centennial of special relativity and Science Magazine wanted to have a kind of all Einstein issue. So Alan and I wrote a rather short and somewhat boring review of inflation. And about a week later, we were, received an email directing us to a website. There had been a point by point rebuttal of everything we'd said about cosmology, not just inflation. Uh, and, and the rebuttal concluded with this rather startling uh, summation. So we had to show you in their own words what these MIT eggheads were saying. That part is um, quite true. Guth and Kaiser need to take up truck driving. That caught my attention. <laughs> that would get them out of their ivory towers at MIT and into the real world, where they would be forced to look at trees, mountains, weather ecology, cheap motels and bad bowling lanes, uh, and all the other observable things on our privileged planet that are inexplicable by chance. Realities that proclaim design, purpose, and intention. This was a, 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 a um, uh, creationist website, a sort of religious, uh, literalist um, uh, website. And so we had stumbled in inadvertently to a different version of the politics of gravity on our own. So again, I want to thank uh, Jerome and Vincent very much for this invitation, but soon I must indeed hit the road. So thank you very much. <laughs> Merci. Thank you very much, David. So, are there comments or questions? Thank you. There's a whole bunch of stuff uh, we could talk about, but the one thing I wonder, you know, now today it's very easy. We're in the, we're in the reverse situation that it was after the war where it was very hard for ideas and information to flow. Mm -hmm. Yes. And now everything is available. And some people say, for instance, that the fact that it's very easy now to find out that something can't be done, does that have some kind of, and also there's a, a group mentality perhaps, mm. does that have some effect in your view on scientific progress, the fact that in fact the flow of information is perhaps too easy? That's a fascinating question. Th thank you very much. I, I'm sure we'll all have um, sort of ideas on that. My first sense is, is the following. I, I'll be curious what, what you think. <clears throat> In my own experience, let me, let me stop being an historian and just reflect on what it's been like to be a grad student and, 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 and researcher over these uh, few decades. Even in the era of archive, which is a great, great, marvelous bounty for us, um, I still find it difficult to learn things really thoroughly f from written things only, right? I think it's why we still fly around the world and spend a week in Paris, which is a lovely thing to do. Um, and interact with colleagues. I think there's something about face-to-face -face communication over and above what we can download in a, in a microsecond from archive. As wonderful, as important as that resource is, I don't know that that has eliminated the need to, to travel, to interact, let alone to, you know, there can be kind of uh, clubby, closed-door networks, even though everyone can post to archive, or in fact, everyone can't post to archive. One needs now, you know, these sort of recommender things and so on. Um, so, so step one is I still I don't think we've we've left the realm entirely where we still need to leave our home office, travel someplace else, spend a week talking with colleagues, really asking you know both standing at the whiteboard what do you mean by that, uh, under the best of circumstances. So I don't think it's entirely different from Einstein visiting David Hilbert or Vesselvled Fredericks or or Willem de Sitter. I think there are aspects of that that still define how we still learn and share ideas and and progress today. 
and, and therefore, if we have to move bodies through space, right, uh, then I think we are, um, we haven't in fact left this realm. And, and uh, alas, someone coming from the United States, you know, it's, it's a lot more difficult now for many people to enter the United States than it, than it was not so long ago. So, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think we've act there are, I see commonalities, let me put it that way, uh, with the earlier era. One of my uh, postdocs, a marvelous postdoc in physics I'm working with now, uh, well, I won't go into too many details, it just, it, he, was, he was potentially subject to this so-called travel ban. It was, it was a nightmare. It was an absolute nightmare. It worked out, thankfully, well for him. But just the notion of having a theoretical physicist come to MIT, work on inflation, what a glorious thing to do, right? And having uh, all, immediately get, get it caught up with visas and, and horrible, very overt, very nasty politics, which again, luckily in this instance was mostly spared, but that was, we didn't know. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. So I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not unique, only a last there. So, so that's, I guess, it's a long way of saying, I, I still see some commonalities with this era, whether it's 1914 or 1952, who can be in the room? I, mean, I think these, these aspects are still with us. Even though we have developed, thankfully, some very effective tools that can, that can help around that. I don't think they've quite replaced it. That's, I, I'd be curious to hear, other, uh, we can talk about that some more, but that's, that's my first sense of that. Yeah, lovely talk. Uh, I get the impression from textbooks that sometime between 1907 and 1910, the happiest thought and his yes. thought experiment showing those gravitational time dilation, yes. that the concept of GR was fully formed, mm. and then it was simply five years of hard effort <laughs> learning differential geometry. Is that, is that historically accurate? I wish that were true, <laughs> and it, um, but it seems to be highly inaccurate. And again, I'm going to draw on a really incredible work by, by my colleagues. Jürgen Renn, I mentioned, John Eisenstadt, who's of course here. Many people have studied this in, in, in greater detail than myself. But what I've learned from them is that Einstein wasn't only, so to speak, lost in the mathematics. He wasn't only learning how to manipulate tensors. He was a smart person. We can, you, know, you can learn that mathematics uh, without five years of delay. In fact, Einstein was, was, was grappling with some very deep conceptual questions and literally convincing himself that A cannot possibly equal B and then three years later saying, oh wait, actually A must equal B. And that's the level of the reversals and it wasn't only because he was, he was making lots of mathematical errors. I mean, but that, that I don't think was the, was the biggest stumbling block. One of the big ones that, that historians have, have, have spent a lot of focus on and physicists and philosophers uh, was basically Einstein rejected general covariance. He understood the notion of it, that, that notion wasn't so hard, and he spent two and a half years arguing why that can't possibly describe laws of nature. Right? That's a big change. That's exactly after the period you described. He had the so-called happiest thought. He thought about many of these thought experiments, the, watching the, the painter, you know, the window washer fall from, from uh, uh, off the scaffold. All these lovely stories that we have, those had already happened. He'd already learned many rudiments of um, differential geometry and tensor calculus from, from his uh, friend from school days, uh, Marcel Grossman. He already was getting the tools, and he convinced himself one can't possibly have general covariance. And then, of course, only in September and October 1915, two and a half years later, did he revis revise his own arguments, like, oh, you know what, actually, I missed something here. Whoosh, comes back. So this was, this was not only uh, mathematical fumbles. There was a lot of very complicated work and it was doing, being done when he, he did not have um, a, a flourishing circle of colleagues with which to, 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 to suss this out. So it's a very tangled web. There's, uh, I showed only very briefly this one page from his notebook from 1912, and that's just to give you a teaser. If you, if you want to spend many, many hours, uh, you might not want to, but if you want to spend many, many hours on this, I uh, advise you or suggest to you to look at this four-volume study four volumes just on the 1912-1913 notebooks. <laughs> That's the level of detail these, these other colleagues have been able to, um, to delve into. Uh, and again, they'll, they'll certainly find many examples of just a flubbed calculation. But it's much more these arguments about, you know, if a region of space has no matter in it, if there's no, if, if T mu nu vanishes here, then is the gravitational field determined or not determined by a vanishing T mu nu? Those are, those are tricky questions, the so-called whole argument. So he had a lot of these almost philosophical kind of fights with himself that really occupied a, a tremendous amount of effort. So it was, it was a very um, bumpy road, intellectual bumpy road. Yeah. Uh, last question. 
Uh, regarding the relations between uh, ideology or politics and uh, relativity, you could also mention the, what happened in the former Soviet Union mm. concerning relativistic cosmology, yes. where it was uh, basically not mentioned for the 30s, 40s, and 50s mm. yes. for ideological reasons, because yes. for, according to some interpretation of dialectical materialism, it was uh, not in agreement with dialectic materialism, the yes. idea of an origin of the universe going back. So there are very strong relations between ideology and politics. In yes, fact. thank you. No, it's a marvelous example. I appreciate that. In fact, one, there's an interesting twist on that. So uh, you're absolutely right, and I agree with you. There's some very good historical work on, on this, the work being, being uh, suppressed, especially during the, the Stalinist era, uh, starting in the, in the late 20s. Um, but but there, then, there, then there's sort of the, the, the epicycles on that. So you may know uh, Vladimir Falk, a great expert in the field, uh, wrote this book in 1955, a lovely, very detailed, thorough monograph. And Falk actually has both in the preface, but also throughout many of the sections of the book itself, sections saying that relativity is actually uniquely well compatible with dialectical materialism. Now, if that was only the preface, you might say Falk was being very wise. He knew the censors would read the opening pages. But in fact, if you go through this, the book on sections on, for example, harmonic coordinates, he says there's really only one physically justifiable set of coordinate systems, which is a very strange thing to read in a textbook on relativity. And he says the harmonic coordinates uniquely make manifest the dialectical materialist notion of matter determining you know, everything else. Right. And that's not just one sentence. That's like over several pages. You know? So that's, so, so some other, again, historians who know this material far better than myself, like Lauren Graham and others uh, who, whom I've learned from, have argued that you know, Falk really was you know, genuinely interested in dialectic materialism ph philosophically. Others were careful not to, to, to misstep or whatever, but, but Falk seemed to think about it in a deep philosophical way. And at least in this instance, that seemed again to be incorporated into his interpretation of the theory itself. Not just, is he allowed to teach it, who, who can he talk with? But in fact, how do we make sense of these? E these equations don't interpret themselves. I guess that's the main, the main point. And so here's a very talented mathematical physicist, Vladimir Falk, trying to bring to it you know, elements from his, from his immediate um, circle. So again, that's, uh, but, but to, to zeroth order, I mean, I think you know, the bigger effect is exactly as you described. This was um, as, as difficult to teach in certain areas there as it had become in, say, Germany in the, in the 30s. So that's, it's an excellent example. Thank you. Thank you. So I think it's time to stop and thank David again Merci. for this thank great you. talk. Thank you.